over the last 25 years, there has been a decline in the church in the country, in the United States, a de-churching, people leaving the church, to the tune of over the last 25 years, 40 million adults have left the church. We today are going to finish this series called Christianity and Crisis, and you know, the, the statistics are kind of rich out there with this big study that was done this past year, largest study that was ever done that showed this incredible phenomenon in the country in which people are leaving the church and have been for the last 25 years. 40 million adults have left. Uh, it is the greatest single uh, decline in church in the history of the country. More people have left. Then, uh, then started going during the first, second Great Awakenings and all of the Billy Graham Crusades combined. And so it represents a historic moment. It's really significant. You know, part of the, the data so far, and we kind of talked about in this whole series, is, is like the people who've left. They call them the de-churched. But there's also other data that's saying some things that are kind of maybe even more alarming, <laughs> if you can imagine that which is to say that there is a projection right now that over the next 35 years that youths, people 16 and older, are going to leave the church to the tune of 35 million people. A million youths a year are expected to be leaving over the next 35 years. In other words, we've not only seen this huge loss of adults, but there's an expectation that the next generation is going to walk out of and leave the church, which means we're not just facing a crisis that we've just been through, but we're facing a crisis in this country in which there's at risk uh, anyone in terms of another generation having and knowing the Christian faith. We're, we're, we're not going to be able to pass the baton on to the next generation. Now, as, we, as we've talked about this uh, through this series, we've, we've said there's some glimmers of hope, right, uh, of the people who've left, 40 million, 51% of them say that they would be willing to come back if they were invited. Um, the greatest felt need of people who've left is to belong. Uh, they need to belong. You know, the, the old saying is you need to, to believe and behave and then belong. But what social uh, relig- uh, uh, sociologists of religion tell us is that people need to belong before they can believe and behave. And we need to change the dynamic in which we need to become a culture that invites people into our lives and invites people uh, into the church. We started the series talking about 1 Corinthians 9, where Paul said, to the Jews I became a Jew, to the Gentiles I became a Gentile. Uh, He says, to all people I became all things, uh, to win as many as possible. Uh, He says he was basically willing to do whatever it takes to reach people for Jesus. And so the goal of the church in this generation, the challenge of the church in this generation, is are we willing to do whatever it takes to reach people for Jesus? Anything short of sin to reach people for Christ. The, the, research, the researchers say that the only way we're going to change the, the trajectory is if the church is willing to pivot. If the church is willing to change. In other words, we're facing a crisis, not only of what is happening, but a crisis of direction in terms of where the church and people within the church are responding to it. One of the biggest challenges, though, is the individual Christians. You know, I, through the series, I've talked about how the, I gave kind of the Brennan Manning quote, you know, the famous one where he says, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle, it is uh, what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. In other words, Brennan's message there is, Manning's message there is, like, like I, I like your, as Gandhi said, I like your Christ, I just not your Christians because they don't look like your Christ. And what our world is longing for are authentic people, good people, uh, caring people, loving people. People who look and sound and talk and act like Jesus. Jesus was not particularly religious. He was particularly loving and deeply devoted to the will and purpose of his Father. 
and he was more interested in reaching people than anything else, but he had in his way a single group of people who always were trying to stop him. And they were not the secular, you know, Romans. They were the devoted religious Pharisees. And in the Gospels, he so often is combating with them. And I, I, I told you in this series, I don't want to be a Pharisee. And I said, I don't want to be a legalist. Today, I want to talk about what I think is at the heart of all of this. And the message today is called, I don't want to be an egotist. I think at the heart of Phariseeism and legalism, if you really look at it in the Gospels, is that they are basically egotistical, is the way we would, we, we would describe that today. They're just really, really focused um, on themselves. I want us to, uh, before we unpack any of this, I want to just read in Matthew chapter 7. This is a, toward the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He's not talking to the Pharisees here at all. He's actually talking to his followers and he gives this instruction, and it's all about, essentially, we need to not be egotistical. In Matthew chapter 7, he says, starting in verse 1, Do not judge, or you will be judged. In the same way you judge others, you'll be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? The word sawdust there can also mean just like a, like a splinter, like just a tiny little piece of, of wood. Why do, you, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? The word plank there like means a, a wooden beam that was used to hold up the roof of a house. So like there's this huge, huge beam. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You, and look what the word he uses here, hypocrite. The word hypocrite, I told you before, means hypocrite in, in the original language. Hypocrites means to make a, 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 a superficial judgment. And Jesus is talking in this whole passage about judging people. And hypocrite also meant an actor. They're busy judging everybody else, but their own lives are so in need of judgment and correction and adjustment. And that's what he's getting at. You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll be able to clearly remove the speck from your brother's eye. The problem in this passage, in, in the original language, the word, the word that's used here, eye, is the word in English, ego, and we have that term egotism. Egotism has been described as the practice of talking and thinking about oneself excessively because of an undue sense of self-importance. This cartoon, I think, kind of gives both the definition and so the guy's like, hey, uh, this lady's like, don't, don't you ever get tired of, you know, patting yourself on the back? You know, it's, it's, it's man, I'm just, man, I am so good at all these things that I'm doing. Golly, look at this great thing I just did, you know. The habit of, egotism is the habit of speaking or thinking of oneself, self-conceit, or even as a sickening egotism. You know, when I think about the Pharisees and the legalists, or even think about Paul, you know, when he talks about, we, we looked at this last time, he would brag about how good he was. Man, I never did this, and I followed all of the law, and I, 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 I. It's all about himself, isn't it? And it's interesting that when we think about how egotistical religious people can be, how legalistic they can be, what we're really talking about is somebody who's really just in love with themselves. And I don't know about you, but if, if there was ever a person who was less in love with themselves, it was Jesus. He was selfless. He was giving. He was loving. He was willing to die for others. And he said, if you want to be my follower, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. The, the, the beginning of the Christian life is the end of egotism. All of our lives are about elevating Jesus and about making ourselves less important than Jesus is. We're in a battle with the, with the ego. Well, today I want to just share this message with you. I don't want to be an egotist. And I want us to look at this passage where Jesus addresses this issue and start by starting where Jesus does with an, with an eye problem. I don't know if you saw in the news this week, there's kind of an amazing story out of uh, Arkansas. There was a, a power line uh, a man working on power lines, and he touched the power line with his face while he was working on it, and like 7,000 volts of electricity, you know, ended him with surgery and no eye and no side of his face, and surgeons were able to like 
give him a face transplant and give him an eye transplant. It's the first time it's ever been done in history, apparently, successfully. And they're hoping that this guy's going to actually be able to see again. And as I was seeing that in the store, when I was reading that in the, in the news, I was thinking to myself, it's amazing that you could have an eye on your body physically, but you can't see. It's not connected like it should be to the optic nerve or to the brain or whatever. But as Jesus is talking about this eye problem here, he's not saying that there's something physically wrong. He's talking about the issue of perception. You and I might be able to see fine, but we are not seeing things the way that we should be seeing them. Um, when, I, uh, when I was growing up, I, I, I say this all the time, and I just, I don't know, it's just, it's just true that I did not grow up going to church, but I did grow up watching church. Every weekend, every Sunday, a local pastor uh, of a church in East Texas where I grew up, and, and, and Tyler at Green Acres Baptist Church, he did his sermons were on television. His name was Paul Powell, and Pastor Pastor Powell, I used to watch his sermons, and later he would become one of my really good friends and mentors and uh, develop a really great relationship with him, and he, he just died a few years ago, but Paul wrote a bunch of little preacher books, you know, books he'd write to preachers with all these stories and sermons, and in one of them, he talked about when he was pastoring at this uh, church in San Marcos before he'd come to Tyler, he pastored First Baptist Ch- Church San Marcos, and a woman in the church came up to him, and, and she's uh, a mother, she said, my 16-year-old son, his life is all messed up. And I need, uh, Pastor, would you mind just going and visiting and just talking to him? I mean, he needs some help. And so Paul said he got in the car, drove out, found this guy, a 16-year-old, living in a, in a mobile home. Uh, and he, he came up to and drove up to the, the, the place where he was. And he said the yard in front where he lived was a, hung, was a junk heap. It was littered with an old automobile motor, an empty 50-gallon oil drum, two automobile tires, and assorted bottles, cans, and boxes. <laughs> uh, we put a, I put a picture. I found something on the internet. I, this isn't the actual picture. I just like that's kind of how I imagine it, you know. Um, but then he said, when I looked at the, the 16-year-old, he said, he looked worse than the yard did. <laughs> Dirty clothes, stringy hair, unshaven face. And he tried to approach him, right? Like, what are you going to say to this guy? So he said, uh, he said uh, you know, like, hey, what's, what are your dreams for your future? What do you intend to do with your life? And the 16-year-old said, I don't know. I've, I've heard that they're messing up the Everglades in Florida. I think I'll go down there and help them clean up the mess. And he said, fella, if you want to clean up something, why don't you start with your front yard? Isn't it interesting how our ego works? We see problems out there. Man, those people in Washington, they don't know what they're doing. Oh, look at the world. Look at all these things that happen in the world. There's problems here. Look at the way those people drive. (laughs) But what we can't seem to notice sometimes is like what's happening in our own front yard, right? Like what's happening in our own self. We have what Jesus here identifies as an eye problem. It's perceptual. The, uh, the famous Russian writer Leo Tolstoy once said that everybody wants to change the world, but nobody wants to change themselves. Everybody sees the problems are out there, but, but why don't we take a minute and like what Jesus says, like look in the mirror and see the reality. Man, you need to do this and you need to do this and this and this and this. The cartoonist kind of redid Jesus's um, story. We can put it here on the screen. Ha ha, you just told him that he has a splinter in his eye and you have a beam in yours. But look, the guy's got like a tree growing out of his face, you know? It, we're so good at that, aren't we? Like, I could tell you everything wrong with you, right? I mean, we just, look at this and look at this and look at this. What I don't want to do is to look and see where I might be part of the problem. And this is what Jesus is trying to get us to see in this subject. And it's part of the crisis of Christianity in our culture because part of what Christians are being observed as is they're being observed in a way that is inauthentic. We're great at telling everybody else what to do, but are we living out or trying to live out the the baseline of Christianity, living out the gospel in a way that we authentically love God and love each other? 
I, I call this EYE I problem and a, a, a personal pronoun I problem. In other words, the letter I, I myself. It's not just a problem of the eye. You go to the doctor and your eye's all red. They're going to say you have conjunctivitis. You have an eye infection. You get older in years maybe. You start to lose some of your vision. They're going to say you got a cataract. We got to remove it. These are physiological problems. This is a perceptual issue. This is an issue that is not just about our eyesight, but it's about our insight. It affects our wisdom. It affects our, pers- our ability to make decisions. A few verses earlier, Jesus said something really strange. Matthew six twenty two. He said, the eye is the light of the body. And if your eyes are bad, your body will be full of darkness. Now, from a, from a physiological perspective, that's true. If your eyes don't work, you're blind. You can't see. But Jesus isn't talking about physical eyesight. He is talking about the problem of looking at the wrong issue, to to stare at your front yard and look past the mess that is your life and to say, oh, the problems are out there without addressing the issue that's right there inside of, of your own situation. And the tendency to focus on other people's issues while ignoring our own is part of the problem as we relate to people in our lives. I meet people all the time who, who are, their lives are just messed up, and they're like, I want to go to church, but I got to get my life straightened up. No, you don't, actually. You need, you got it out of order. You first of all need God in your life. You need grace in your life. You need Christ in your life, and Jesus Christ will change your life. Well, people get this thing all out of order, and part of it is because the church has become a place of such a culture where it's like, well, I don't know if if I want these, these sinners to come in here. In order to relate to people who are de-churched or unchurched or lost, the authors of this a book about the great de-churching say that a critical piece is that Christians in the church have got to learn what they call relational wisdom. Relational wisdom means the wisdom of how to relate to people. As we relate to people in our everyday lives, we've got to learn to relate to them where they are. We've got to learn to listen. We've got to learn to put ourselves in their shoes. Now, if any of that sounds familiar to you, we just did a series just before this series on human connection. And what the authors say is most needed are Christians who understand how to connect with other people, how to care about other people. You and I will never do that, though, if we are only focused on ourselves. You and I will never do that if all we're concerned about is us and all we want to do is point out the problem out there with everyone else. What happens with an I problem is it becomes a you problem. Now, I like the phrase you problem. Sometimes people come and say, hey, I've got this problem, and I'm like, I can't do anything about it. It's a you problem. <laughs> you work on solving that problem. But a you problem in this, in this passage could also be described like this. You know, um, I learned as a kid, you probably did too, that you shouldn't point. Don't point at people. And the old saying is, is that when you point at someone, you have three fingers pointed back at yourself. Now, the, 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 the saying about pointing is actually true because the reality, based on what Jesus is saying in this passage, is that as I tend to focus on others, the chances are really high that I'm not noticing all the ways that I am not doing the things that I should be doing, that the real issues are being overlooked for me. Sigmund Freud is one of the fathers of modern psychology. He, of course, was not a Christian, but Freud was a keen observer And one of the things that Freud said was that much of what we do wrong as human beings is a reaction to our ego. It's that Greek word for I. It's the personal pronoun. Ego. Ego in Greek is how you pronounce it. It, We get the word egotism or egotistical. Freud's idea was that, that if you really studied human behavior, everyone is trying to protect their ego. They'll do anything they can to protect the ego. One of the things that people like to do, he says, is they'll deny that there even is a problem, even though the elephant is in the middle of the room and everyone else can see it. It's like the guy who has the trash in his front yard but wants to go and fix the Everglades. 
The problem is right there, but because of our ego, we don't want to acknowledge the actual issue we need to address. We would rather try to divert our attention to some other issue or some other problem. The problem is really out there. The prophets of the Old Testament were told by God to go to a, a, a generation of people and tell them the truth. The prophets Isaiah and Ezekiel had messages like this one. This is Ezekiel 12 too. God said to Ezekiel, son of man, you're living among a rebellious people. They have eyes to see, but they don't see. They have ears to hear, but they don't hear. They are a rebellious people. Wait a minute, hold on a second. Who's Ezekiel talking to? Is he talking to the secular pagan society? No. These are the people of God. This is the nation of God. This is the nation that's been won by God and saved by God and, and covenanted with God a relationship. These are God's people, but God's people don't see, he says. God's people don't hear, God, God says. They have a, an eye problem that's become a, a you problem. They are spiritually blind to what the real issues are. Uh, years and years and years ago, over there in what is now the most populated country in the world, we call it today India, uh, 1.4 billion people live in India. There is a, a very, very famous parable out of India that an American author by the name of John Godfrey Sachs rewrote in a po into a poem in the 1800s. The, the poem is called The Blind Men and the Elephant. And I love the, uh, the story. I don't know if you've heard it before. Probably you have. But it's an imaginary encounter uh, in, which vert, in which six highly educated blind Indian men uh, c come in contact with an elephant for the very first time. And as they're making their, their encounter with the elephant, they are each only able to touch a different part of the animal. And the poet writes, it was six men of Hindustan, to learning much inclined, who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy the mind. And the first approached the elephant, happening to fall against its broad and sturdy side, and at once began to bawl, bless me, it seems the elephant is very much like a wall. And you feel the side of an elephant, it kind of feels like that, right? The second feeling of his, of his tusk cried, Ha! Huh, what have we here? So very round and smooth and sharp, tis, to me it's mighty clear, this wonder of an elephant is very much like a spear. And the third approached the animal and happening to take the squirming trunk within his hands and boldly spake, I see, quoth he, the elephant is like a snake. The fourth reached out his hand and felt about the knee what most this wondrous beast is like is mighty plain, quoth he, that tis clear enough the elephant is like a tree. The fifth who chanced to touch the ear said, even the blindest man can tell what this resembles most. Deny the fact who can, this marvel of an elephant is like a fan. And then the last guy, the sixth, no sooner had begun about the beast to grope than seizing on the swinging tail that fell within his scope. I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a rope. And so these men of Hindustan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong. Though each was partly in the right, all were in the wrong. Incredible moment. The poet's not done yet, though. He adds this closing. So often in theologic wars, the disputants, I ween, rail on in utter ignorance of what each other mean, and prayed about an elephant not one of them has seen. It's interesting what the American author did with that old story. He made it about the church. Not a six blind men feeling about an elephant, each of them absolutely convinced that they had the elephant figured out. But the elephant was in the middle of the room and they couldn't see. So often the modern American church has found itself in the middle of some ridiculous controversy or in the middle of some theologic war, as he put it, while the world is going to hell, while our neighbors 
are lost. And while the young generation is walking out the church, and an entire 40 million have already left. We've entered crisis in Christianity, and so many people are busy walking about like blind men in Hindustan. In other words, this I problem that's become a you problem, in Jesus' language here, has become a big problem. And it needs to be addressed for what it is. Sometime in my early childhood, I started losing some of my eyesight. Some of you probably had the same experience where you couldn't see as well from a distance or whatever. When I got into high school, I started wearing contacts. My vision really got worse and worse throughout much, much of my life. They, every time I'd go in, they'd make my prescription stronger and stronger and stronger. And finally, the doctor said, you know, you're a good candidate for eye surgery. You ought to go to get Lasix done. A few years ago, I went and got my eyes surgically redone. And when I went back in for the exam afterwards, hoping to get 20-20 vision, they told me that I had better than 20-20 vision. I had 20-15. I can't tell you what it's like to have not been able to see in the middle of the night and then wake up in the middle of the night and see the alarm clock or whatever else. It's amazing to go from a place where you can't see physically to a place where you can see completely. The issue that we have before us today is one of focus, seeing things the way they really are. Today, the church in this country needs to focus on the right problem. Stop being the blind men of Hindustan. Stop focusing on the theologic wars or the this or the that. And let's focus on the thing that is the main thing, that is the driving thing, that is the heart of the issue of the faith. Loving God, loving neighbor, accomplishing the great commission of Jesus in our world. Now, if we don't do this, these stakes are enormous. And if we don't do this, we have to ask ourselves, why are we not willing to do it? And I think the answer goes right back to that. Why am I not willing to do it? Me, myself, and I. And here I think we have the problem that lies at the heart of all of this. It is the oldest sin in existence. It's the problem of human pride. Pride manifests itself in all kinds of different ways in our life. We are living in a culture of egotism. We are living in a culture that looks a lot like the Greek mythologist. Who, you remember the guy named Narcissus who just stared at himself until he like, died? We are a culture suffering from the disease of narcissism. We are the selfie generations. We're obsessed about ourselves. But at the heart of the gospel, the heart of the Christian message is a selflessness. It is a sense in which it says that if you want to be my follower, Jesus said, you start by denying yourself and taking up your cross and following him. And at the heart of the gospel is a sense of selflessness and that God showed us what love is and that he was willing to send his own son to die for us. That Jesus was so selfless that he would embody this for us. If we do not take this on, then we are, at the end of the day, guilty of the sin of pride. The book of Proverbs warned long ago of the danger of pride in Proverbs 16, 18, when it said, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Every time I read that passage, I always think of that story of the, the frog that lived in the dried up swamp and asked the birds to fly him out to greener pastures and wetter ponds. And the bird said, we can't do that. And the frog said, I have a great idea. I'll put a stick in my mouth and you put it in your beaks and we will fly away. And sure enough, it worked. You can see the frog flying away and the farmer looks up and says, wow, that is awesome. I wonder who came up with that idea. And the frog says, I did. Phew, splat. He just couldn't keep his mouth shut, right? He couldn't resist the temptation to say, I did it. We are living in a culture that so much wants to make it about ourselves, and we are serving a God who tells us that the beginning of following him is about making it not about ourselves. It's never been about us, and it's always been about him. And when we embrace that way of living, we are following Christ. And what this unbelieving world is longing to see is they're longing to see people who look like Jesus, selfless like Jesus. 
So if I can finish this series, I want to say these things. I want to say that how we treat people matters to God. How we love our neighbors. And the, our neighbors are not the people who live next to us, by the way. Go read the story of the parable. This, go read the, the Good Samaritan parable. The Good Samaritan were, the, were, were not the neighbors of the Jews who lived next door. They were the hated enemies. Who is your neighbor is probably somebody right now you don't even like. They're probably somebody you don't even want to be around. But to love your neighbor, to love your enemy, to love the person that you don't even like is to embrace the very heart and character of God. And this world desperately needs people who will do that. The second thing I, I wrote down is hypocritical Phariseeism. The pretending to be religious while on the inside really not really caring that much about God or other people is keeping people from the kingdom of God. And then finally, I want to ask you, are you personally ready to do what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, which is whatever it takes to win people for Jesus? Are you prepared to do whatever it takes to win people for Jesus to the point that you yourself are willing to change? The Christian life begins and ends with a decision. Am I willing to take up the cross and follow him? Am I willing to deny myself and what I want and to embrace what Jesus Christ has called me to? The Christian life is a life of discipleship. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says that when God calls a man, he bids him come and die. But the thing is, is that when we die to ourselves, Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless, not I, but Christ lives within me. We begin to find new life that really matters. And I want to invite you and, and I today to contemplate what it would mean for us in this crisis of our culture, in this crisis of our country, in, in the crisis of Christianity in our world. Would we be a part of the solution and not be the problem? Let's pray together. Father, we just humble ourselves before you today underneath your mighty hand, and we acknowledge that our world is in desperate need, but God, that the solution requires for us to become who you've called us to be, who you've invited us to be, who you've died for us to become to become like you, to follow you, to embrace the values that you valued most, which was a deep commitment to the Father and a loving relationship with other people. God, as we contemplate the situation in the country, in the world today, as we see never-ending wars and never-ending violence, as we see uh, the, the smartest intellectuals, the most influential politicians, incapable of solving our world's problems. We look to you today, God, as the Savior, as the, salute, as the solution. And Lord, we know that the problem is not going to be found in our ability to assert ourselves or to elevate ourselves, but in our willingness to serve and humble before your mighty hand and lift up the name of Jesus Christ in this generation to model and live out the value of who Jesus was in our lives. God, we desperately need Christians, real Christians, authentic Christians, Christians who acknowledge the imperfection of their life and not pretend to be better than everybody else, Christians who are humble enough, loving enough to invite people that we don't even like like one author said, God, uh, Christianity is one beggar showing another beggar just where to find a piece of bread. And our world is hungry, spiritually hungry for life that can be found only in Jesus Christ. Lord, may this generation, may this moment, may this situation 
be the turning point in a positive direction. God, may it be the tipping point of you doing something new and powerful and profound. And Lord, if it doesn't start anywhere else, let it start here. Let it start in this room. Let it start in us personally with revival happening in our own hearts and our own lives today. That God, that you would do it through us as we just get out of the way. I pray, God, that you would move through the power of your spirit in this message, in this church, in this community. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with me this morning? We're going to continue to worship. This is a time of our invitation, time of prayer, and you're invited to come and pray. I'll be here at the front if God's moving in your heart today in some way to come. After the service, as always, I'll be out here in the hallway, and if you'd like to make some decision or join the church or have some questions about something, I'd love to talk with you. However God is speaking to your heart today, my prayer for you and me is for us to get out of the way and just live out the authentic Christian life for this generation, for our neighbors, for our world. Desperately needs to hear it and definitely needs to see it. You come as the Lord leads you.